Welcome to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our focus is the novel coronavirus. I'm Josh Sharfstein, a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and also a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal with this podcast is to bring evidence and experts to help you understand today's news about the novel coronavirus and what it means for tomorrow. If you have questions, you can email them to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, I speak to Dr. Karen Carroll, the Director of the Division of Medical Microbiology at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. We take a look behind the scenes of testing for the novel coronavirus. Let's listen. Dr. Carroll, thank you so much for joining me. You are the head of the Johns Hopkins Microbiology Lab. And so tell me uh, what it was like in the early days of COVID-19. So in the early days, uh, we knew that we were going to have to offer testing for not only the Johns Hopkins Hospital, but also the Johns Hopkins Medical System. And we uh, decided to attempt to uh, initially acquire reagents through the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, but that uh, was not an option for us. And so once the FDA allowed academic medical centers to develop their own tests under the FDA emergency use authorization rules, we set about to uh, design our own assay. So people hear about that, that you know, academic medical centers like Johns Hopkins, you know, just set up their tests, but it's not that simple, right? is it? Well, what did you actually have to do? So the first thing we had to do is we had to obtain genetic control material uh, so that we could make the appropriate controls and then also actually design the components of the test. And so on March 5th, we were lucky to receive the control genetic materials from the University of Texas Medical Branch. And so, consequently, on March 7th, we were able to design the test. Now, what does that mean? Well, we had to acquire chemicals, the chemicals that go into the design of the test that would allow us to amplify the viral nucleic acid, the viral RNA. So we worked with a company called Altona. That company is a company that has helped us design other molecular tests that we have offered in our clinical laboratory. They designed their own COVID-19 assay and they were very happy to work with us and make those chemicals available to us. And so between having the controlled genetic material and the chemicals that we were obtained from Altona, we were able to design our assay. So you've got at that point the basic assay design. What does that mean in terms of how many tests you can do? Right. So initially, basically, we started just testing control material. So we wanted to make sure that the chemicals that we received from the company allowed us to detect the virus and also that the, that the reagents or chemicals that we obtained from the company did not falsely call other viruses positive. So what we did initially was we evaluated the reagents in the lab to make sure that they did not cross-react with similar viruses like other coronaviruses that we typically see in the U.S. and other types of viruses such as influenza that may appear in a patient's sample. And uh, I'm happy to say that, that our assay is 100 percent specific meaning that it does not cross-react with any of the other common viruses that people may have. Got it. So, so that's a big scientific box to check. Exactly. So that was one big box. And then another big box was to determine exactly how many viral particles 
the assay was able to detect, something that we call analytical sensitivity. And so the way we do that is we take known genetic material and we dilute it down to uh, zero particles, and this allows us to determine just how analytically sensitive the assay is. And so we were happy with the results of the analytical testing. So once we had the analytical testing done and we were happy with the performance analytically, then we were able to take known positive patient samples and known negative patient samples as determined by the CDC assay. We were able to compare our new test to the results of the CDC test. And uh, that allowed us then to complete what we call validation and then to start testing actual patient samples. Got it. So I'm sure that was a great feeling to now be able to test patients. When you got started, how many can you do? Is this a automated procedure? Does it require people to do each, per, you know, each test? How does it work? Right. So the laboratory developed test using the Altonic chemicals that I mentioned actually required multiple hands-on steps. The first step was to take the patient sample and place it into a buffer. The buffer uh, breaks open the viral particles, exposing the insides of the virus, the nucleic acid of the virus. And then once it's in the buffer, we put it on a, an automated instrument. And what that instrument does is it concentrates the viral nucleic acid. We call that an extraction or an extractor. And it cleans up, it concentrates and cleans up the viral nucleic acid. So that was done on a robot. Once we had then the purified uh, viral nucleic acid, then we were able to perform the, the actual PCR test. So that process took approximately four to five hours. So in the beginning, because of the manual nature uh, of the test, as well as the fact that we had very limited reagents in the beginning, we were only able to perform approximately 50 tests per day. People hear a lot about reagents. There's limited reagents. What, what role do reagents play in this? And what are reagents? Right. So reagents are the various types of chemicals required to perform the test. So there are buffers which stabilize and clean up and, and help concentrate the viral nucleic acid. And then there are also the primers and probes that are part of the nucleic acid amplification test. And those were the reagents that we actually, or the chemicals that we actually acquired from the company called Altona. I see, so re reagents are essentially the other components besides the patient sample, or at least some of the other. Right, so they're buffers and they're, and they're also the uh, primers and probes that bind to the viral nucleic acid and make copies of it during the PCR reaction. Okay, so now you've got a test that takes a while. You've got a test, which is good. It takes a while. You can do hundreds, but you know you're probably going to need more. Right, right. And so what did you do then? So... <laughs> Because we had limited reagents and the demand was uh, growing by the day, we reached out to some of the companies that announced to us that they were applying for the FDA emergency use authorization for their COVID-19 kits. And we are, are fortunate that we are a very large lab and a complex lab, so we did have uh, a variety of different manufacturers' platforms 
to uh, perform this type of testing. As by platform, I mean an instrument that would allow us to uh, perform, specifically perform a COVID-19 test. The problem with uh, most of the manufacturer's assays was again the reality for the companies that they could not scale up quickly enough to meet the national demand. So while we have these instruments in our laboratory, many other laboratories also have these instruments and we're also expecting companies to provide the kits for their laboratories. So if I, if I could just pause you for a second, I have this image that if we were together in your lab, we could walk around and you would show me the different instruments that in theory could do COVID-19 tests if you had all the supplies for them. Is that... Absolutely. And I will tell you, it is uh, five different instruments. <laughs> so you, you have five different machines that could be running COVID-19 tests, but you just, you just have to have the supplies for the ones that you're going to use. That's correct. And we reached out to uh, one company that would have allowed us to do hundreds uh, a day. However, this company just told us that no reagents would be made available to us because they were asked by the federal government to divert their kits to laboratories on the West Coast who at the time were actually having the greatest number of cases and to the reference laboratories such as Quest and LabCorp that were trying to meet the demands of those West Coast cities. So, you know, we weren't able to actually get any reagents for that particular platform. And then for the others, the companies gave us limited inventory. But, you know, in combination with the limited inventory and our own lab developed tests, this actually did allow us by mid March to perform about 300 tests per day. Now, you've been able to increase from there, is that right? Yes, we have. So we were able to acquire a, a new platform in the laboratory, one that we did not have. And that instrument uh, is a, a robot that automates many of the manual tests that I mentioned, or ma many of the manual steps, I should say, that are involved with our lab developed test. So basically, we just take the patient sample, place it in the buffer tube, and then put the buffer tubes on the instrument, and then the instrument does the rest of the work, which is very nice. And with that instrument, we are able to do about um, 600 tests per day. Again, we could do more. However, the, the capacity is limited just by the availability of the reagents. I mean, in theory, you could have all five machines going at once if you had plenty of reagents. Exactly. And, th and throughout the last eight weeks of our testing, we have scaled up or scaled down depending upon the availability of the, sh the shipments of, of the reagents. That, I mean, that sounds frustrating. I, you know, I think it is frustrating, and I have to say it's not unique to our situation that there are other laboratories out there facing the same uh, shortages um, and may not have the, you know, abundance of platforms that, that we have. Perhaps they only have one, and, and to be told that we have to ration the supply uh, is very frustrating, and, and many are not meeting the expectations of their health systems. So that has been very frustrating for many people. I mean, it's remarkable. Have you been able to balance these different platforms and reagents in order to get as many tests done as, as you have? As you, as you look forward, what do you think needs to happen to fix access to testing? Because, you know, some of the estimates are we need to be doing a lot more testing to make sure that everybody with symptoms gets tested or other people at nursing homes or, you know, many other different ideas people have for testing. But you've been trying to piece things together. What, what do you think it will take to have a breakthrough? So I do believe that our, our manufacturers, you know, the companies that we have been partnering with have 
put a lot of energy into totally turning over their manufacturing processing to get these kits out. So I do feel that companies are trying to do the best that they can to, re to respond to this emergency. And I feel we are at a good place currently with all of the testing that, that we are doing. I think part of the issue now is even if laboratories get the reagents that they need to run them on the particular instruments that they have in their labs, there is a very acute shortage of swabs. And in some geographic locations in the transport media that we put the swab in after it's collected from the patient. Right. And all that happens outside the lab. You get the swab and transport media. Right. That happens outside of the lab. So really the, the current crisis, I think, with testing is the availability of the swabs. Um, I do want to say that I think companies are really trying to scale up their inventory. Uh, I don't think they're quite there yet to meet the demands of their customers, but they're working very hard to get there. And I bet the people in your lab have been working pretty hard too, based on that story. Absolutely. Around the clock. Well, thank you so much for taking a little bit of time from that just to explain what it's taken to do this and how we can start to think maybe about more testing in the future. I really appreciate your time. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Please send questions to be covered in future podcasts to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. This podcast is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Lamare Morales. Audio production by Niall Owen-McCusker and Spencer Greer, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.